three, two, one. We are live. Hi, everybody. This is Greg Decaus with the Dice Must Flow. And I have uh, Jeff Lobkovitz, if that is correct, I believe. Anyway, Jeff is with, uh, normally with, you're with Travel Buddy Games today. Uh, you also work with for Gray Fox. Is that true? Normally. And uh, I'm going to turn my um, volume down over on that. Sorry. I'm an expert. <laughs> That's good. I got, I got the loop in my head. Greg, you did such a great job with my with my last name that you called me Jeff instead of Josh for my first name. Oh my gosh! <laughs> See, I was so worried about getting his Josh's first name, last name. Can we start over? You nailed it. Three, two. One. <laughs> anyway, I got Josh here. We'll do it. we'll do it in uh, buddy games <laughs> and uh, the Great Barrier Reef today. So, um, yep. And I actually have known Josh for years now, so I don't know why I screwed up. But uh, <laughs> Josh, can you tell me a little bit about your Travel Buddy games? And uh, I know you got a nice mission statement and niche you want to fill. So tell me about what, what sure. your um, is. Absolutely. So uh, as you mentioned earlier, I, I do work for Gray Fox Games. I'm a partner in, in that enterprise. But Travel Buddy Games is my own indie publishing startup. And the idea behind uh, Travel Buddy is that we want to make games for travelers um, and games that gamers can travel with. So we have three criteria for the titles that we sign. We want them to be small so that they're easy to travel with. Uh, and we want them to be approachable so that you can take them with you, uh, you know, on a trip and be able to teach them to any new friends you might make along the way. And then all of them are, of course, themed to a travel destination. So we're really trying to, to hit this niche of games that have gamer sensibilities, but maybe appeal more to a, a casual market and uh, the kind of thing that you can take in your bag and play anywhere. Uh, in addition to those three criteria, one of the things that we're, we're striving for with our Travel Buddy titles is this kind of notion of social responsibility um, in so the Great Barrier Reef game um, is going to have a one-page rule book, which is going to be customary for all our games, because we want them to be that level of approachable. But it's also going to have a one-page fact sheet. And that's going to be a, a dual-sided page that, on the, on the one hand, is like, hey, here are some cool facts about the reef. Here are some reasons to visit. Um, you know, Here's a reason to put this place on your bucket list if it's not there already. And then the flip side is going to be about the challenges that are kind of facing the reef right now, like overfishing and coral bleaching and what sort of things that we can do for conservation efforts. Um, one of the things that is, is easy to incorporate that I use when traveling all the time now is reef safe sunscreen, um, because you know you never know, you know, for spending an extra a dollar on your sunscreen, you can swim easily in an area that has a reef and know that you're not contributing to any sort of ecological decay. So um, yeah, we, we want our games to kind of bring bring the world to gamers and uh, and give gamers a reason to see the world. <laughs> Great. I mean, that's uh, really, uh, really a nice uh, idea. So um, I was noticing that, so you're not the designer of this, uh, the Great Barrier Reef game. I know you've done, a, you do a lot of tweaking on designs and stuff, but who is the designer and how did you guys get together? Uh, so the designer is Keith Piggott, and uh, he's somebody that I've known for a couple of years now um, through my work with Gray Fox. Um, one of the primary things that I do for Gray Fox is development and acquisition. During convention season, I'm the one who takes pitches, finds designs, uh, and finds the stuff that, uh, that we want to sign. And so I've built a lot of relationships with designers over the years. Uh, doing that. Uh, from previous titles, he had a pitch to Gray Fox. Uh, and then when he heard that I was doing this travel buddy project, he reached out and had something to show me, um, and it was this game. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this this was originally um, called Aquascape, and it was themed after keeping an aquarium. And uh, when Keith pitched it to me, you know, played it, and I thought the mechanisms were really cool. And so he and I brainstormed on some ways to adapt it to be um, sort of larger, worldly, and fit more into the travel desk. So the Great Barrier Reef card game is where it ended up. OK, great. And I, I just know that uh, one of the things that jumped out to me right away was you know the colors and the vibrancy. And uh, 
I thought, you know, I, I, have, a, I have a little granddaughter now, and I thought this was going to be like, would look like a great family type game. Uh, she's too young for this, but even just getting the cards and showing her all the fish, um, I think is going to be something and, uh, that, that she'll enjoy. So, and I hopped right on this game. I know I have, uh, I backed it, but um, you said that, so this is like, just talk about the game a little bit. Um, it's a card game um, and you get to curate or create a portion of your reef uh, that best, best suits the needs of the sea life that lives there. Lives there. Uh, was on the uh, Kickstarter page, and um, mm -hmm. if I could, the game is basically what played by each player playing cards into their own reef, trying to get certain layouts for the lack of a term, certain combos of fish, um, and uh, th that's pretty uh, pretty cool. I think I uh, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna try and do a screen share here. And go over to your Kickstarter page so people can see a little bit about what we're talking about. Because that's got to be more interesting than looking at me. <laughs> okay. So we got your Kickstarter screen up here. And so, um, like I said, the uh, um, you can see these cards are, are colorful. And uh, each of them have like four fish on them. And... The way the game is played, you're playing this into your your reef, and I've seen a lot of tile playing games, but what I really found interesting about this game is that this these cards are essentially quadrants, and you lay these cards where you cover up a portion of you can cover up a quarter or a half of the card, and, and build your 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 laying that your tile lays that way. I was going to try and go to a page and shows where it shows that. So like here, you're trying to get two clownfish. Uh, next to each other uh, to get a certain pattern. And I think that's really something that unique. I haven't really seen that in other games. And so uh, I really like that. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing this. Do you have any thoughts about any more on the game design? I, yeah, I mean, uh, that the overlaying uh, card mechanism to create those patterns is something that, that I really love as well. Um, the The... When, when you're playing the Great Barrier Reef card game, it's really satisfying to build out your own reef. And so obviously your first your first card play is just a card, and then all subsequent card plays will cover up some portion of the reef that you've already created. Um, in a way, this feels really fitting to me because it's this ever-evolving ecosystem where some fish are thriving and some are disappearing, and it kind of mirrors the way that um, reefs work in real life. Um, it's satisfying to get that big thing in front of you, and you always have this beautiful tableau when the game is over that you built. Um, so I like that mechanism, and I, I like games that use overlapping card play as well, like Hunshu is a game that I really love and has some of that. It's not a pattern-making game in, in this kind of direct way. Like Great Barrier Reef might say, you need three, uh, three clownfish in that in a box. And so you're trying to overlap them to create that specific pattern. Um, Hanshu does something similar with many different terrain types. Um, so it's a mechanism that I've seen elsewhere and, and really like. Um, but yeah, the, the, the overlaying aspect of the reef is not only really interesting, but a nice metaphor for the way things um, work in, in reefs realistically. And so some of the concepts that have been abstracted for this game, I think when you think about how they work in the real world shine through really interestingly. So one of the one of the creatures that you'll you'll find on these cards are the crown of thorns starfish. And those are an invasive species in, in the reef right now. And so they count as um, negative uh, victory points when they yeah that's the guy when they when they exist in your reef at the end of the game so not only are you trying to create these positive patterns where you're creating schools of fish the way that um, they want to school to get you points but you're also trying to preserve things like the coral that's pictured on the screen now that pink one the more coral you have in your reef the more bonus points you get but you're also trying to eliminate things like the crown of thorn starfish which are invasive and you don't want them in your reef and so those, those mechanisms are interesting to me for the kind of narrative they tell in a really abstract sense. Um, 
later on in the page, there's a, a reference to the kind of scoring manipulation using things like the sponges and the sharks. And the way those play out also feel thematic to me as well, sponges being essentially a food source uh, in the reef. When you cover those up, you get to boost your score for one of the fish. And the premise there is the, the fish are feasting on that prey and therefore becoming more dominant in the reef. With the sharks, um, you get to move a, a scoring token up and a scoring token down, kind of mirroring the fact that when the sharks prey, obviously it's not great for the population that they prey on, but Oh, you kind of it does open up a niche in the ecosystem for something. Right. And so we uh, did you lose me? Yeah, we did kind of lose you. So let's you were talking about sharks. Oh, I was just saying that um, the sharks move one score marker up and one score marker down, which kind of mirrors this notion that when the sharks prey on a particular species, obviously it's not great for that species, but as one uh, one part of an ecosystem is um, is being hunted, it opens room for other parts of that ecosystem to thrive. And so there's kind of an interesting implied narrative in what is functionally a, a, a strongly abstracted version of the events in the reef. So I find that really interesting. Right. And um, as a gamer, um, that leads to a, a lot of, uh, with, with a multiplayer game, I think that leads to a lot of strategy, mm -hmm. right? That you can be trying to uh, boost uh, your reef or bring down, you know, somebody else's if they obviously have a, a I don't, uh, you know, like a blue tang, and they're trying to build a bunch of blue tangs. Um, then, uh, if you play a shark that eats on the blue tang, it could reduce the score of the blue tangs. Yeah. So, and so those those uh shark um the the sponge is scored immediately. That's something I didn't realize. Well, I, the sharks and the sponges both manipulate the scoring, right? It, so all, all of your scoring is done at the end of the game, but when you cover one of those things in your ecosystem, you run that effect immediately. So the game has this ebb and flow about what is going up and what is going down. So there's a there's a, a bit of player interaction in not, not only watching what other people are building and trying to use opportunities to minimize the bonuses they'll get from that, but also kind of following along, right? If you've spent a lot of time building up the bonus for clownfish, um, I can try to aggressively reduce the bonus for clownfish, but there's only a very limited number of sharks in the game. It's I may take my opportunity to take a, a pot shot at you there, but the safer route for me is to try and also compete there. If you build you know, one of the patterns that the clownfish need and I build one of the patterns that the clownfish need, we're both going to score the same amount of points for that thing. So right. there's certainly an interesting dynamic in the multiplayer game about who is following who, who is doing something on their own, who is trying to boost a particular thing, who is trying to keep a particular thing down. Um, and one of the things we made a, a conscious effort of is that though you can directly alter those scoring multipliers, nothing ever goes to zero. So if you build a pattern, you're always going to score something for it. And then your ability to manipulate those scoring potentials just has to do with how many, how many bonuses you're going to get for scoring it. You'll never build something and get nothing. <laughs> okay. So one other thing that I've noticed is and talking about these scoring mechanisms. So uh, when the game is set up, you deal out, is, is it five scoring cards? Um, yep. And so you deal out these cards that I'm that I'm like clicking at, and then you're gonna randomly just assign the fish to the cards. So you've really got a whole lot of different variations of how this game is gonna play um, because different fish are gonna be worth different things. And I assume- yeah. you, Correct me if I'm wrong. That some there's a different amount of fish on the cards. So like you were, like these cards, there's not always the same amount of clowns or the same amount of um, blue tangs or or they're they're certainly different on the cards. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's absolutely true. I mean, there are uh, five uh, scoring fish, in addition to the coral, the sponges, the tiger sharks, and the crown of thorn starfish. And with four quadrants on a card, um, you can only represent four of those potentially eight different things. Uh, the way the game that is the way that the game is set up, you're always using a subset of the cards. So some number are removed randomly based on the on the player count. And so you never have any idea what kind of fish are going to be dominant in the reef today. Uh, in, a, in addition to the to that variation, the scoring setup um, with the five cards and the five fish, it's essentially always the same five scoring um, conditions then randomize what they apply to. But we've already started unlocking um, stretch goals that are going to increase that variation. And so hopefully by the time this campaign is finished, we've we've taken that number from six, where it is now already offering some variety, up to closer to eight, nine, or 10, um, which great. really adds a lot of variability and replayability to the game. And um, we're going to we're going to mark any of those included uh, stretch goals as ad advanced because each of them scores a little bit um, in, a, in a way that is slightly more complex than just the patterns. So the one we've unlocked already is um, for shy fish that want to be functionally on the edge of the reef. They don't want to be surrounded by other fish. Um, and so that is already a different way of thinking about it than these pattern matching things. And so um, the, the combinations become really interesting and, and fun as you add in more of those advanced goals. Great. And so I see we do have a couple of viewers in on live. So if anybody has any comments, go ahead and um, throw them in and, and we'll try and get, uh, get you answers for those. I think that the- Yeah, thanks for joining us live. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting is, is the way the market plays out. And I've got that up here on the screen now and it, um, it's not really super complex or anything, but it can lead to a lot of strategy, I think. So basically the way this works is when you're going to play this card, for example, what's shown here, um, when you play this second clownfish card here, it's got a number one on it, which means, and I'm drawing it out to here that the market number one is you're going to get this card into your hand. And so maybe you want to get a card in your, that maybe you want to get a card in your hand um, that is not even, re, you may be playing a card, let me say, that is not one that you really want to play just to be getting a card that's in the market, which is the one you want to play next time around. And so uh, that, yeah, would, that mechanism, that's a really neat mechanism. I, I, I think that's uh, so this game is very simple from what I'm seeing, but it looks like it's very thinky is the right. I don't know if that's the right way to yeah. say it. There's a lot of thought involved. You, no, you, I, I think that's fair. You could go, you could go too deep, quote unquote, get it reef deep. Um, but, it's, but I think that that's, you can make it as deep as you want, I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, the response that we've gotten from reviewers um, has, well, I mean, from reviewers, previewers, travel bloggers, anybody we've sent this to has come back and said, I, I read the one page rules, I understood how to play right away. And then as soon as I started playing, I thought, oh my God, this has a lot more depth than, than I was expecting. Um, yeah. That market mechanism is, as a gamer, my favorite part of this. It's, it's the thing that I've never seen before and the thing that I really love. And so much of this game is about the timing of what comes out of the market that if the player before me draws a card from that market and it becomes replaced with a card that is perfect for me to fix my pattern or to create my pattern, there's, there's no way that I can expect that we're gonna go around the table and that's still gonna be there for me. If I want it, I need to take it now. And so often, I have a plan for what card I'm going to play. And then based on how the market changes, I think, OK, well, I need that card. So I'm going to play a card with a three on it to get the card in the three spot. And then I have to figure out where to put it. So it's really this interesting decision every turn about whether I'm playing a card that expands my reef in exactly the way I want it, 
or whether I'm playing a card that gets me a card from the market that I want, even if it expands my reef differently than I had planned. And, and balancing those things is is fascinating to me. Um, and the thing that um, makes every turn interesting in this game, despite the fact there's you know really only two rules about how to play your cards, um, I still end up with satisfying choices every time. Yeah, it does. See, there's just uh, it's really full of uh, choices and intrigue. I think because you can be like, I I want to take that card. Am I going to take the gamble that it's going to be there next time so I can play this scoring thing this time? And if I have to play something else, am I going to wreck my scoring thing that I had planned to get that card? So you're going to be balancing all of those. So I really think that's pretty cool. So, um, yeah. I mean, you, you really want to high five yourself on a turn where you've been able to do both, right? When you play a card that not only expands your reef in the way that you want, but lets you pick up the card from the market is just, it's a very satisfying feeling. <laughs> So um, just kind of going to the game uh, is currently live on Kickstarter. It runs till when? Uh, uh, I think we've got 20, 24 days left. It was a, a four-week campaign. So uh, I'm looking at it here. Um, so with the game, you're getting these 68 reef cards, which some uh, may, may not be used every game, depending on the number of players. I think you said there's always some that are not used um, that's true the scoring cards and you get a scoring marker and you get the five fish and the uh, number of tokens for the market so all that's cool uh, how big are these cards are they like uh, they are they're mini euro size cards um, so they are uh, well I mean I don't know I don't know how much that means to people necessarily but they are functionally ha half the size of a standard playing card um, okay. so I've I've got kind of the standard playing card here, and then the reef card uh, on it. So awesome, perfect. Yep. So yeah, so that playing standard playing card I just showed you is from uh, the Kickstarter that Gray Fox has live right now from the prototype that is on, that is on my desk. <laughs> hey, that's fine. So basically, this is one of the by having those smaller cards, you're going to be able to play it in a travel environment, right? So you're going to have, uh, you don't need a big uh, footprint to play it. You don't need a big footprint to play it. I mean, I, the, the whole premise of making these small is that I, I can hand it to you in a box that I'd love for you to put in your pocket, but it's easy, easily going to fit in your backpack or your carry-on bag. Um, most of the time, we'd love for you to be able to play our, our games on a on a tray table, on a train or an airplane uh, or something like that. And um, this game works, though it can be a little tight. Um, every player's individual reef is going to fit on a, on a tray table comfortably. You just need to make sure that you have room for the market, which will spread out a little bit uh, extra. So if you're if you're in a plain row by yourself and you have all three of those tables, you can play this easily two players. Great. What does your uh, scuba promo do? Is, is that kind of gonna be, guy going to be anything in the game? He is, yeah. That's a, it's a special Kickstarter exclusive promo. The scuba diver is functionally a, a wild card, and so when the when you're playing with the scuba diver diver promo, you're going to shuffle that card into your into your reef deck. So at some point during during the game, the scuba diver will appear, and then whenever you would play a card that would have you pick up the scuba diver, you're going to choose any of the other cards in the market to add to your hand and move the scuba diver to the space that you picked up. So mm -hmm. he basically swims around in the market and gives you more choices for what, what you can have available to you with any given card play. Cool. So, um, so right now, uh, it, it looks like everything that you've got here, you're complete, you're ready to go, ready to go to print. All you need is the funding. I mean, we were talking earlier, this is like a true Kickstarter. And for you, where uh, this is your your personal first project, but you know you do have a lot of experience mm -hmm. running these things through Gray Fox and everything. I know you uh, with Champions of Midgard, people probably have heard of, and other Gray Fox things. So uh, I'm sure you're ready and you're well aware of how to run a campaign. I just want to point that out to people. 
Yeah, I mean, I certainly have a, a lot of experience um, working on Kickstarters, developing games for Kickstarters, um, you know, designing and developing stretch goals, things like that. Um, the As far as doing spec sheets and getting quotes, I'm familiar with all of that process. The only thing that is actually genuinely new to me is kind of the logistics and fulfillment portion of this. And fortunately, because of my time working with Gray Fox, I have a lot of great industry contacts and people that I can lean on to help me with the things that are a first time for me. But yeah, this is this is a genuine a genuine Kickstarter in the in the sense that I've set the funding goal to where we need it to make the game. And if we don't fund, we don't make the game. And it's <laughs> it's it's that simple. Um, I'm I'm fortunate enough to have uh, have garnered some decent attention towards the beginning of this campaign. We're well on track to fund, and so now um, it's just it's just an ever building excitement about um, you know when we'll fund and how far beyond we can go and how many stretch goals we can unlock and that sort of thing. Um, we are all set to go to print uh, based on some feedback we've had from. Uh, reviewers and previewers. We're probably going to alter some of the way the graphics are displayed for clarity, but they're the kind of changes that you know the graphic designer I've hired to help me with this can do in a weekend. So honestly, the day this Kickstarter closes, we will have files that we can send to the printer and begin the process. Um, we're pretty confident in our timelines, and uh, and I've been in communication with my printer through most of this campaign, and he doesn't anticipate any delays either. Um, the actual kind of suggested uh, timeline is that it's three months for the printing and three months for the delivery. Um, we've set the, the fulfillment date for December, which is actually going to give us eight months to get there. Um, and with any luck, we will, we will deliver this project to our backers early. <laughs> Great. I was just going to ask you, I know with the uh... The current world situation, I know that it's uh, the delivery and the printing, if it's um, could be, uh, I was going to ask if you've been in contact with your printer. Obviously, you, you beat me to that. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I guess, uh, finally, uh, you, you, I think I saw on your uh, Kickstarter page, you have this game available online that people can actually play somewhere for free yep. to try and out. Right. We have it on Tabletop Simulator. Um, so the mod is certainly free, though you have to own Tabletop Simulator to be able to play. Um, that is a, it's normally a $20 um, purchase, Tabletop Simulator is. Uh, often you can find keys somewhere for less. I know that very recently they were running a special where they were doing four for 60 um, that some people got in on. Where, so if you have Tabletop Simulator, it's free to play now. It's public. You should be able to find it and play it uh, relatively easily. Um, and I've got the link to it posted on my Twitter feed um, and in the Facebook group we've got. So if you can't find it searching, you can find it that way. Um, we're also working on getting it on Tabletopia. So that one was set up and private as of two days ago, has, has recently been submitted for review by their team to make it public. And that one, I believe, is wholly free to play through your browser, no additional software required. Excuse me. So um, that one's just a question of waiting for them to approve the mod, and then it's good to go. And we'd love for people to hop on and play it and try it. If you're looking at the Kickstarter and want to try before you buy, there's a way that you can do that. And if you're already a backer and you're, and you're anxious to get this to the table early, uh, it's available for you as well. Great. So um, just kind of winding down here, I was going to say, let's talk some travel. Uh, obviously, you've been quite inspired by travel. Where, What's your favorite place that you've traveled? Uh, oh, boy. I, I love and hate that question. What's that? <laughs> I said I love and hate that question. Um, it, it's, it's hard to have a, a favorite place, right? I, I love to travel, and there's... There's honestly never been anywhere I've gone that I left um, disappointed, right? I love I love I traveling agree. abroad and being international and uh, and and exploring new cultures. Uh, I'm I'm pretty decent with languages, and so I get myself to survival level before I go somewhere, and then have fun making a fool of myself trying to chat with the locals. Um, I lived in China for a year, and and, uh, and I loved that experience. Um, it is. 
it's it's not fair, honestly, to compare China to anywhere else because the country is so huge and has such history and has such a wealth of destinations. Um, I mean, it's it's like the U.S. in that way, and that there's a million cool places to go, and you'll never see them all. <laughs> um, so I love that. I love Prague. Uh, that's the city of my ancestors. It's a beautiful city for walking. Um, but I mean, I, I also love to travel and eat, and anywhere that has uh, has interesting food is a place that I'm going to love. Uh, the, the next thing on my list is actually going to be Albania. So we've we had a trip planned to the Albanian Riviera this year. Um, the beaches are great, and the the people seem very nice, and the food looks delicious. Um, obviously, we're not going anywhere in the in the near term foreseeable future, um, but. We're gonna go ahead and replan that trip um, once once the world situation gets better than it is now, and I'm looking forward to going and exploring uh, Albania as well. <laughs> right. Do you have any other place that you're kind of on your bucket list? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the whole the whole Mediterranean region is on there. So my wife, I, excuse me, my wife and I have long been talking about going to to Italy. And, uh, and I would love to do that soon too. Uh, again, the food is really tempting. Uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to go to Thailand, which is uh, the Southeast Asian destination that I haven't been to um, that is highest on my list. And like I said, lo loved my trips in China and, uh, and we loved going to Singapore. Um, I mean, in no small part, and no, well, <laughs> gonna have to edit that one, in no small part due to the hawker centers um, because I mean, street street food is something that I think uh, you could build a life around uh, traveling the world and sampling and never be sick of the sort of wealth of delicacies the world has to offer. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Italy. I went to Italy three years ago, and that was always my wife and I's dream trip. And so we, uh, uh, we got to Rome and uh, Venice, um, and then we actually took a day trip down to Pompeii in the Amalfi nice. and uh, I mean, just amazing uh, stuff. And and uh, we, I loved it. Yeah. So I've been to Germany and, and and Spain too, but yeah, Italy was just incredible. So yeah, that's I, great to hear. <laughs> thumbs up review for me. And you talk about gaming. It was or travel travel gaming. We took a train from Rome to Venice, and there was a couple people on the train. Playing, I think it was uh, King Domino. So yeah, that's that's great. I mean, honestly, having traveled some some in Europe um, on trains, I'm always I'm always pleased by how sociable people are. Um, it's it's certainly different than when riding the train in the U.S. So you very rarely have strangers want to sit and chat. And I've always you know made friends on trains uh, traveling internationally. And this notion that I could have a game and introduce them is something that is. Um, really, it really excites me to be able to have these games and bring them with me. And it's something that I that I do already with um, with other publishers' games. Um, the perplexed pack O games that come in those little gum packs with the with the tiny cards are something that I always have in my backpack and have often played on trains when traveling. Um, most recently, when we were in Essen last year, every time we traveled around Germany on the train, we'd break out those pack O games and and get a game going. <laughs> Great. So, uh, anything else that you want to share? Um, what you guys in the future? How do people get a hold of you? Uh, sure, I I will give a I'll plug my social media uh, here, and then uh, give you a little sneak peek of some upcoming projects. Um, so people can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Um, on Facebook, we are Travel Buddy Games. On Instagram, we are Travel Buddy Games, and on uh, and on Twitter, we're Travel Buddy Games, but our handle uh, is too long, so it's just at Travel Buddy Game singular. Um, so people can can find Travel Buddy Games there and and stay abreast of the news. Um, they can also follow me on Twitter at J Lobkovitz, um, and rather than spelling that out, maybe we can just leave it in the in the notes on the notes. on the video when we're done. Um, and then as far as what we've got upcoming, I've got two games that we're working on right now. Um, one of them is a backpacking through Europe game that is a, a route building card game. Uh, and the other one is a is a hot air balloon themed game that we're going to model after hot air balloon festivals that is 
a push your luck and deduction game. Uh, that one is farther out, uh, but the design is really stellar and the testing is going great on it. The uh, backpacking through Europe game is much closer to done. So as soon as um, Great Barrier Reef goes to the printer, we'll start working on putting together graphics for this. And one of the things that I'm most proud of with this game is the uh, approach that we have to, um, to the card art. So in the Backpacking Through Europe game, we've actually sourced hundreds and hundreds of photos from actual travel bloggers that we're going to touch up into a similar style and use where we incorporate the travel community in the process of making our games. And so um, we're excited to be partnering with, yeah, we're excited to be partnering with do dozens of bloggers to use their actual travel photos to show off the location in the game, and I think it's a really cool aesthetic, but also a great way to involve that community. Well, let me know if you need some Italy pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Please, send them over. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's about it for now, um, and uh, I just want to say best of luck on the uh, uh, campaign. I'm looking forward to uh, smashing some uh, some stretch goals, getting maybe some more scoring cards or, or some other things that you, I'm sure you got some stuff planned. And so uh, mm -hmm. just hoping to, to see this guy go, and I wish you guys best of luck. And when you get your backpacking game going, we'll, uh, I'd love to talk to you about that too. So is there anything I'd else? Love to, I'd love to come back, so I'll keep you posted. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, um, and uh, best of luck. Uh, we will talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs> see you guys. All right, I hit end broadcast.